Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. I want to welcome you to Crossroads and welcome those who are watching at home as well on, on this uh, warm February morning, right? Isn't life like the weather? One day it's 60 and, uh, and then it's cold today, but, uh, but we roll with the punches, right? I want to invite you to take out your message outline so you could follow along. We're beginning a new series uh, for the next couple of weeks in preparation for the events of uh, Palm Sunday to Easter. You know, really any time of the year, you want to circle the wagons and have our focus to be strong on God, but particularly the weeks leading up uh, to Easter. And so um, as some might call it the Lenten season, um, it's important that you and I have this, uh, this zero in focused on God and the, the heart and the message of our Christian faith. And so in preparation for all of that, we're going to be talking about repentance over the next couple of weeks, uh, service, generosity, prayer. And then today, I want to discuss with you uh, the practice of fasting. And really, uh, we think of these things as best practices, whether it's a business, an organization, a team, a family, and yes, even a church, there are practices that help lead you and I to a pathway of success and spiritual growth. And that's really what the next couple of weeks could be. It could provide you and I the opportunity uh, to put these things that God has in the scriptures before you and I, that we could uh, do them and hopefully bless our relationship. And so I want to talk with you about the practice of fasting. And you'll notice here in your notes, the practice of fasting um, is much more than chocolate, okay? That's usually, I think they said that's the number one thing people say, I'm fasting during Lent for, ch- I'm giving up chocolate. I'm gonna stop cursing at people uh, for, the, for the whole Lent season. And then after Easter, I won't do it on Monday. I'll, Tuesday, I'll start cursing on people after Easter, okay? I'll give it an extra day. I'll go back to cursing people. I, I, obviously, it's much more than, than cursing and chocolate when you talk about fasting. And so here's what it says here. The practice of fasting is the voluntary action. Keep that in mind. The voluntary action of reducing or refraining from food for a specific time or purpose. And the Bible has so much to say about fasting. And I think God in his infinite wisdom knows that fasting is good for us physically, emotionally, mentally, relationally, and of course, spiritually. I would go as far to say that we stand to gain a lot from understanding what the Bible says about fasting. Because there's a lot of bad information out there, wrong information out there, just as there is when it comes to the nutrition and physical world as far as it pertains to fasting, and the same is true spiritually. So what does the Bible have to say about fasting? Well, right here in your notes, you'll notice uh, there's, and there's so many examples of it, but I whittled the list down to about 10 or so. But uh, you might recall Moses fasted before he got the 10 commandments. And you find that in Exodus chapter 34, verse 28. Jehoshaphat fasted for protection. You might recall in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, the enemies of Judah were coming upon them from the left and the right. And what did they do? They ordered a national fast. Let me tell you, we need that in our country right now. I know every year they have the national day of prayer, but that's become so broad that it's more just kind of tipping the cap to people uh, who claim to have faith. We need, you know what we need right now? We need a a day of fasting in our country because of all that's going on. And I think that would be a a great campaign promise, right? We're going to have a national day of fasting uh, because the best protection is God. Because when King Jehoshaphat ordered the fast, what had happened after that? Well, when the enemies came, they didn't even lift a spear or a bow and God defeated their enemies. A great story to recall. Um, Anna fasted. Remember, Anna lost her, her husband very young, but she remained faithful in the temple and waiting for the Messiah to come. And she exemplified faithfulness, but fasting was a part of her grief strategy, was a part of helping her get through and being so committed all those years. The church at Antioch fasted concerning uh, guidance and ministry leaders. This is obviously after the ascension of Christ. Ezra fasted for traveling mercies and his God's protection upon him. The Pharisees fasted for attention. Obviously, that's not a good example, uh, but that's a negative one that you want to look at. Um, And we'll cover that in uh, today's message. And then let's talk about Jesus because he talked about this quite a bit. Jesus fasted and he actually modeled it. He fasted it. Uh, during intense temptation in Matthew chapter 4. He talked about 
fasting in, and taught on it in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And then uh, what we're going to zero in on today, Jesus responded to questions concerning fasting. And uh, we're going to look at Mark's account of that. And so turn with me to the second chapter of Mark's gospel. As you find your place there, if you're new to the gospel, or even if you're very familiar with it, as you know, Mark got his information from Peter. Peter discipled Mark. And so Peter uh, provided great information. And really, this is kind of like Mark slash Peter's gospel. And Mark is going to give us this account of a time when Jesus is questioned, and I would like to say sarcastically, about, anybody know anything about sarcasm? Some of you have the gift of sarcasm, anybody? Okay, well, Jesus was sarcastically questioned about fasting, but as a result of the sarcasm by these, these characters here, we get a great picture of what fasting is and also what it's not, by the way. And so starting in verse 18 of Mark chapter two, let's read this verse and then we'll arrive as well at a context. We'll, we'll backfill it. It says, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. That's what we're told. And people from both camps, both John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, said to him, that's Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples, they're a bunch of govones, they don't fast, okay? Well, that, that's not in there. I just added that part, but because that's what they're implying, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, who are John's disciples? Well, not the apostle John, because he's, we know he's going to be one of Jesus' disciples. He's talking about who? John the Baptist. You might recall that John the Baptist had a conversation with his disciples, and he said, there's one coming that's greater than I. And then when Jesus did come, he basically, like a maitre d', it, it escorted his disciples to say, you follow him. But some of John's disciples were loyal to John to a fault. They didn't listen to what he said too good. And they were so loyal that they got jealous of the crowds that Jesus was having. So much so that Jesus had to tell John, uh, John had to tell his disciples rather, you know what? He must increase and I must decrease. And anything we have is from above anyway. Don't be concerned with that. But I guess they, they weren't getting that message. At this juncture in history, when you harmonize the accounts and the timeline of John the Baptist, he's in prison by the time this happens. So he can't give them a proverbial slap around the face or the back of the head for the nonsense here. But they're questioning Jesus. These are John's disciples, not under the approval of John because he's already told them, you gotta go follow him. But they're jealous of Jesus. And then we find out the Pharisees' disciples. Now the Pharisees were the religious leaders who when you study the gospels were in constant conflict with Jesus over what he taught and over some of his behaviors. And one of them here has to do with fasting because they're going, hey, we're fasting. And what happens is both groups come together to team up to go against Jesus and they have a motivation. One group is jealous and we know the Pharisees, they're so insincere. Now, why do we say that? Because Jesus had to tell them your fasting is insincere. They would fast to be noticed. Now, how do we know that? Well, rabbinic tradition tells us that they would fast on Monday and Thursday, the busiest days in the marketplace, so that people could see them. Because what would happen? They would look disheveled, and then you would go, wow, what's wrong with you? Oh, I've been fasting. So spiritual, I've been fasting. That's why I look so terrible. And it would, again, it would give people the opportunity to go, wow, look how great this person is. They're fasting. I'm, I'm eating a sandwich over here, and they're fasting. And it was kind of a superiority thing. And there are people like that, even to this day. I know people like that. This one guy in particular, and he's a lot smarter than me. And I have no problem saying that. Um, and he should know a lot more than me. He's older than me. But every time I get together with him, it's about once a year, this group of pastors from around different parts of the country. Every time I talk to him, how you doing? Oh, I'm coming off a long fast. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, when's it going to stop? You know, I, like every time you see this guy, he doesn't look like he's fasting as much, but, but once, he, once he, I shouldn't have said that. Right? I have said that. That's, that's what I should say. But it's a little ridiculous. They're always fasting. Don't, obviously you're not supposed to tell anybody about that. 
you know, like it's supposed to be between you and God. And, and, and that's not the reason we do it. But that's what the Pharisees were doing. It was to be noticed. It was for people to go, wow, you're so, you're so spiritual. And obviously, if that's the reason you're doing it, you're missing the whole point. And so this was the delegation that came against Jesus about all of this. Now, why also are they bringing this up now? Well, let's talk about the context. What just happened? Jesus called Matthew, who was a tax collector, to come and follow him. Matthew, by profession, does pretty well, okay? He's making bank, as we like to say. So he then, as a result of his conversion, says, I'm going to have everybody over to eat. So he hosts a big-time dinner. So while they're feasting, they're fasting, and now they're criticizing. You with me so far? That's what's going on. That's the context of all of this. But in their guile, it provides for you and I a foundational principle for our relationship with God, especially now this time of the year as we get ready for Easter, and especially with fasting. So write this first principle down. If you're going to fast, if you're going to do this best practice of fasting, here it is, address unhealthy pride. Can you say that with me? Undress unhealthy pride. You, you can't be someone who's going to, I'm going to fast to be noticed. I'm going to fast for my own selfish reasons. Because again, why do a lot of people fast sometimes? Well, I got a wedding coming up. I got to look good, okay? Again, you could do that in terms of a physical nature, but that's not necessarily a spiritual reason to fast. Um, and we'll get to those reasons in the next segment here but of the message. But, you know, it, certainly pride is not to be the driving force for why we do this. Because after all, it's to be a voluntary action, isn't it? You may be surprised to know this, but the Bible doesn't command people to fast. It's a voluntary action, but it's mentioned so much in the Bible that it's an what we might refer to as an implied, like an unspoken command. Really, the only prescription of fasting you might see is that would say this was some type of a command looks back to the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29, it was said that you are to humbly fast in preparation and understanding the Day of Atonement. And that's when, obviously, it was the understanding of our sins being forgiven. But other than that, it was all voluntary. All these examples that we gave were all voluntary. And so certainly pride is not to be a part of it because pride is foolish um, and pride will always lead to a fall. Look what it says here in your notes in the 16th chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Why don't we say this verse together aloud, together. Pride. Isn't that the truth? Pride comes before a fall, the Bible tells us. And usually pridefulness and foolishness go hand in hand. It seems like there's always one of these stories like, a, like every month, but I read about a young lady who was in need of some money, so she does what everybody does. She robs a bank, right? Okay, I don't I tell you. Not everybody, but so she robs a bank in Nebraska, in uh, Cornerstone Bank in Waco, Nebraska, and then she wasn't a very smart criminal because then she took to YouTube and talked about the whole thing, even flashing the money, not too smart. So the police didn't even need the good description that the bank employees gave. They were able to arrest her rather quickly. And so pride, bragging about her criminality, uh, led to her arrest. Let me tell you, pride will lead to you and I, as well as our foolishness, to paying the price. See, God wants to bless us, but we have to be willing to empty ourselves of pride. It was the great evangelist, the D.L. Moody, who said it this way. He said, I believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride, selfishness and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit, will fill every corner of our hearts. And really, when you talk about fasting, you want to maximize God's presence. And if pride is there, it will get in the way because pride reveals ego. And what do we say ego stands for? Edging God out. And so we want to be the type of people that are being humble before God, no matter how strong or great we might think we are. I'm reminded of uh, former heavyweight uh, boxer James Quick Tills, 
who was a cowboy from Oklahoma. That, that's where his hometown was. And he got his fighting start and uh, professional start in Chicago. And he recalls um, when he was on his way to the Windy City and his arrival. And he said this, I got, I quote, I got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under my arms in downtown Chicago. And I stopped in front of the Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down. I looked up at the tower and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. And when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. Somebody stole my suitcase. <laughs> you know, pride. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're big in ourselves. That will get in the way of you and I and our fast. And we're going to get into the details of fasting in just a moment. See, God wants to give you and I grace. And he'll give a lot, of, a lot of grace when we're fasting and we're doing it with the right reasons. Look what it says here in James chapter 4, verse 6. Why don't we say this verse together aloud? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God wants to give grace to you and I, but we must, we must not be proud. We must be a humble people. And so God wants our focus to be on that. That's the baseline here. You know, if God has to constantly spend all his time correcting my stupidity, if that's the extent of my relationship with God, that it's this constant cycle of, uh, okay, take a step forward, then five steps back in pride, then you know what happens? Instead of God using the time that he would use to fill my heart with more truth, more purpose, to believe more, all my relationship with him consists of is this, this back and forth about my stupidity. Now, he loves you and I. He doesn't mind cleaning us up and bringing us up, but there's more than just that. God has a plan for you and I. Let's move into the zone of I'm hearing from God and God's opening doors and God has a new, new territory for me to conquer. God has new blessings for me to walk in. But if I'm always, it's always about me and my pridefulness, well, then the Spirit's using its time to work on that. It's kind of like a parent. You know, a, a good parent is not going to open up other opportunities of blessing if the child's disobedient, then that's where all the time has to go to because you don't want the child to crash and burn. And that's how God looks at you and I. And so let's use fasting as an opportunity to address any unhealthy pride. Let me tell you this and be very clear. Nothing will sabotage your walk with God more and the calling God has for you more than pride. Pride cometh before every, it's the center of every stupid thing you and I have ever done. And the enemy wants us to walk in pride. And God's heart is that we would be people of humility. When we're humble with God, we'll be humble with each other. That is the formula here that God wants us to say. And you can't talk about fasting without addressing unhealthy pride. Now, as we move on to the next group of verses, Jesus is going to respond. And he's going to respond by giving three illustrations. How many illustrations? Three. Here's the first one. And out of the three, this is probably the most familiar one. Let me read it through. And Jesus said to them, because again, here comes the delegation. John's disciples, they're jealous. The John the Baptist disciples, that is, they're jealous. The Pharisees' disciples, their leaders, they're just so caught up in their selfishness. They want everybody to clap and applaud how spiritual they are. So that equals pride. So here comes that, that it's a prideful, sarcastic question. Why aren't your guy, why are they having a feast over at Matthew's house when they should be fasting? What's wrong with them? It was really a, a kind of a judgmental question, a legalistic question, if you will, as we understand the context. Here comes Jesus' response. And we'll, again, this will be familiar to you and I in our culture. Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. What is Jesus talking about here? Well, to understand that, who's the bridegroom? Jesus, that's right. It's the Lord Jesus. He's the bridegroom. Now, when you study Old Testament prophecy, and then obviously very clear in the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation, Jesus, uh, we're the bride of Christ. That's the picture that we're given, and he's the bridegroom. So we understand that, you know, you have a wedding, a, a man and a woman, and you have a bride and a groom, and you have the groom, and the bridegroom's guests, those are his what? 
That's the bridal party. Those are his, those are his best buddies, maybe the best man and other people who would be, say, qualified to be the best man. Now, everybody at the wedding is important, especially the people that give good gifts, by the way. But, but no, I'm just kidding. But, you, but, but the bridal party, those are your best buddies. And Jesus is saying, how, how ridiculous would it be to be invited to a wedding and say, I'm fasting. I can't have anything. Even if somebody has a certain type of eating regimen, they can make something in the kitchen. It's a catering hall, right? They can, vegetables or something, if they're not going to eat what's on the menu. But to say, you know what? I'm not for health reasons, but I'm, I'm fasting. That's why I'm not, I'm not going to go to the cocktail hour because I'm fasting. No hors d'oeuvres for me. Are you crazy? I would think. Okay. Some people fast before they go to the wedding. Okay. That's what Jesus is saying. It's ridiculous. It would be ridiculous to say that. It would also be rude because somebody has put together this party, this celebration. It's a time of celebration, a wedding. Now, why is Jesus saying that? Well, he's with them. He's the bridegroom. But a time is coming, he's saying, when the bridegroom will be taken. Now, circle that word taken in your notes. It comes from the Greek word aparuo. Can you say that with me? Aparuo. It means to be violently, suddenly taken. What is he referring to? the crucifixion, the betrayal, and then the crucifixion, that a time is coming when I'll no longer be here. So he's saying, while I'm here, my disciples don't need to fast because I'm here, because I'm the presence that you should be seeking in a fast, but if you knew who I really was, you would understand that you too don't need to fast, but a time is coming when you will need to fast. Are you with me so far with that? And so I'm with you, so you don't need to fast, so they don't need to fast. So all this talk about fasting and trying to condemn them, they're doing the right thing, but a time will come when they will be fasting. We see that in the book of Acts, but that time is not now. Now, this discussion reveals a very important point here, and you want to write this down. Balance celebration and preparation. Can you say that with me? Balance, celebration, and preparation. Let me tell you, this point is not only something we're just talking about in church. This is something that can help you mentally, psychologically, emotionally, relationally, that I want to develop a balance in my life. As a believer, I want to have a balance that, you know what? When I come to church on Sunday, I'm celebrating that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Is that a funeral parlor? I'm coming. He's off the cross. He's risen from the dead. That's what this is about. I'm coming to celebrate who he is, and I know that he's going to occupy the praises of his people. And there's, you know, there's healing in these words, you know, and it's not about a show. I know our culture today is the generation of the show. It's not a show. We're coming to seek the Savior. And so when we come with that focus, even if you're coming in with your worst day, your worst night, God is going to fill you up with his presence and his spirit. I'm celebrating who he is. When I come to study, Bible study, I'm celebrating who he is. When I'm opening up the word in the morning, I'm celebrating who he is. There's a time of celebration, but there has to be a time of preparation too. And that's what fasting is. Fasting is me preparing myself for maybe what God wants to do. I'm preparing for an answer that God wants to give. I'm preparing for discernment that God wants to lay on my heart and my mind. I'm preparing because God wants to do something in me. But if I'm holding on to my past, if I'm holding on to my sin, how am I going to move forward? Fasting allows me to prepare. You know, it, it, think of it in terms of a boxer, somebody who's training. And before he steps in the ring, the ring is the celebration of the preparation. And so you want to be preparing. You want to be in the gym, spiritually speaking. You're getting stronger. You're developing spiritual muscle. You're working out your salvation because God has celebration ahead of you and I. The Bible makes clear that our, his blessings are going to chase us down. But again, if we're too busy living life in a selfish way, we're missing out what God has for me and has for you. We want to be prepared. The great Benjamin Franklin said it this way, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. We want to be preparing God ground. You can't pray for rain. Listen to this now. You can't pray for rain if you're not preparing the fields for rain. This is a statement of faith when you fast, that God, I trust you. 
that God, you, you're going to make a way because you're the way maker, that God, you have the final say, not anything else, but you do. I'm balancing again, preparation, celebration. And now my mind, you know, I'm starting to take my eyes off of the things of the world and I'm putting them on the things of God. Instead of living in fear, I'm living in faith now. That this is God's heart for me. That's what he wants. And really, anything that's going to be successful in my life requires preparation. It was Henry Ford who observed before everything else, getting ready is the secret to success. I want to get my heart ready with God. I want, to, I want the spirit to work on my life. And see, that's it. We're, we're operating on a spirit understanding. After the last service we had, uh, one of the dear brothers in the church, I love this guy, he came up to me because he goes, man, I love the message on fasting. He goes, so um, you purposely didn't direct us on what type of fast we can do. I said, you're exactly right, because that's the business of the Holy Spirit. I said, we don't want to program fasting. That was the problem with the Pharisees. We want to know what the Bible says on it. We want to see the examples of it. And then we're going to leave God to lead you and I on when and how long and exactly what to do. That's how we're going to prepare. That's how we're going to build the house. It, it requires planning first, and then we go forward. Look what it says here in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 27. Let's say this verse uh, together aloud, together. Do your before building your house. Let me prepare the fields because God is going to send the rain, because God's going to send the supplies to build the rest of it. And so in the Bible, uh, there are specific examples of fasting um, we mentioned earlier, but there's also lengths of fasting. Now, these lengths are not something that you've got to be legalistic about and do them, but let me just uh, bring a few of them out to you. A uh, 40-day fast was done by Moses and Jesus. 21-day fast done by Daniel. Daniel also did a 10-day fast. Now, you might recall Daniel did this fast um, when he was brought into Babylon. Remember, uh, they besieged Jerusalem, and they wanted uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, that's Daniel's friends, um, together, and they wanted them to eat of the king's table, his delicatessen. But the problem with his food was, was that he had it offered to idols and that violated their convictions and their understanding of the Mosaic law. And so what did they do? They said, we're gonna fast. They got permission, they ate vegetables for a 10 day period of time. And when they were looked over, when they were examined, they looked better than everybody else. What happened after that? They then came up with an infomercial. No, I'm just kidding, they didn't do that. <laughs> that, that comes on at 2 a.m. in the morning on how you can lose weight. And if you, no, they didn't do that. But, uh, but God blessed them. God bless them. And then a three-day fast was done by Esther and Paul. We see in Acts 9, um, Esther and Esther 4, 16. A one-day fast we see connected to the Day of Atonement. And then we see partial fast done by David and others. See, God knows what he's doing with fasting. When you study fasting, clinically speaking, fasting for long periods of time have been linked to providing greater health because it's, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's redeeminal, is that it provides greater health for things like emotional disorders, psychological disorders, even disease, even with recovery from a surgery or an illness. As um, the great Dr. Fred, um, our, you know, our, our household nutritionist here at the church, um, great man of God, as he always says, is that fasting, when you fast over a certain period of time, it allows your body to use that energy that would normally be put to breaking foods down to be reallocated to other parts of your body to promote greater healing. God knows what he's doing. And so fasting is spiritual, fasting is physical, it's emotional, and it also teaches us discipline. God knows what he's doing. And so again, to Jesus's illustration, um, it would be ridiculous to fast with him in your presence. And we know his presence is with us, but the understanding he's physically not here, and so that's why we fast. But it would be equally ridiculous not to fast. And so we want to be people who aren't being disrespectful to the bridegroom, to the Lord. We want to make sure we're connecting with him and fasting and we're doing it right. That that's God's heart for me and his heart for you. Now, these last grouping of verses, we mentioned that this, this illustration, listen, everybody understands the illustration of a wedding, right? We all know about that. Let me tell you something. Once again, just to look at what Jesus said, it would be rude uh, to fast at somebody's wedding, but I think it would be sinful. How about a Venetian hour? You ever go to a Venetian hour? Imagine saying you're fasting during then. What's wrong with you at that point? But So we understand the wedding part. 
But these next two illustrations are not so familiar with us in current day terms, but we'll explain them. Verse 21 of Mark's gospel says, Jesus continues with the second illustration. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and a worse tear is made. Now let's hold it right there at verse 21. Um, Now we might be able to buy heavy duty patches, say online, Amazon, and get it the next day and put it on there, no problem. Obviously they didn't have Prime and those things those days. And so with the limited technology uh, and and the the ability to make patches, uh, they would never work because when the garment would be washed, the, the patch would stretch, the fabric would stretch away, and then the tear would get even worse. And so Jesus is saying, you know, you don't put a patch to try to fix something. He's illustrating something here. You're going to notice this common theme of old and new. Now, the next illustration, he says, and no one puts a new wine into old wineskins. Now, what in the world is that? Well, in ancient Israel, they kept the wine in animal skin. I know, sounds great, right? Very attractive. But they kept the wine in animal skin and particularly goat skin. And the goat skin, you had to use new wine skins because if you poured new wine into old wine skins, see the wine, as it would ferment, it would expand and it would compromise the elasticity of the goat skin, thus it would burst. And so Jesus is saying, you don't put new wine into old wine skin. You don't put a patch on a garment. What is he illustrating here? Well, the old garment, the old wine skin is what? It's the religious traditions of the religious leaders. The newness is, he's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And what he's saying is, is that you don't put the message of the gospel and you don't try to patch it with your religious system and you don't try to put it in old wineskins. They don't go together. Impossible is that you need to understand that God's doing a new thing. This new message is what your life needs to be about. You're so caught up in the legalism of all these things, and you're trying to patch this and patch that and fill that, when you haven't realized the center point of fasting, the center point of my presence is that greater is me that is in you than he that is in this world. You're missing all of that. And so write this last principle. Well, this principle is already written down for you so you don't miss it. Here it is. Choose to trust God's timing and provision. Can you say that with me? Choose to trust God's timing and provision. Oh, that's the heart of fasting, isn't it? That I do it the right way without pride. I balance celebration and preparation. I'm preparing my heart for great things. But here it is that I'm doing this because I'm trusting God's timing. Because you don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many of us have been praying and we're going, God, when's this going to happen? I've been praying for a while. You know, maybe, listen, I mentioned Anna, by the way. Anna lost her husband early on, probably in her early 20s. And she wasn't in her 80s until the Messiah, the baby Messiah came through the temple. That's a long time being faithful. You know, sometimes we look at life and we go, man, it didn't happen now. God's forgotten me. No, he hasn't. He knows every prayer you've prayed. We see it in the Old Testament, it says he collects our prayers. They're in a bottle, they're in a bowl in the, in the, New, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. By, I wrote a devotion one time about bottles, prayers, and bowls, okay? He knows every prayer you've prayed. He knows every tear that has fallen down your face. You wanna keep in mind that as you fast, you're just saying, God, I declare your timing over any schedule that I want. See, when you think that way, that's gonna stop you from making wrong turns from settling and not pursuing God's best. That now when I'm in this headspace, this spirit space of going, God, I'm choosing your timing and your provision that you could provide greater than anything I could ever even pray for. Oh, it's a game changer. And that's what this principle of these illustrations are about that you want your rabbinic religious traditions to be what saves you. I'm the one that's gonna come to save you. And let me tell you, he's talking about the gospel, the finished work on the cross that he was about to do and perform for all for all of humanity. And for those who, who choose to believe that God is called, we know that that's the great provision. So let me just poise this and put this out to you. If you could trust God with the greatest provisional need of all time, which is forgiveness of sin, why can't we trust him for everything else, right? And fasting puts that all into perspective. We need his help. You know, and during this Lenten season, 
Again, people have lots of different thoughts. And, you know, I, matter of fact, this is usually when I get a lot of questions about Lent, and those are good questions, by the way. The word Lent isn't necessarily mentioned in the Bible. Um, listen, Bible isn't in the Bible. Oh, the word Bible is in the Bible. It doesn't mean we're not going to read our Bible. So, so um, it's, it's, when you think about Lent in terms of, okay, uh, you know, I want to repent of sins. I, I want to be more committed to God. I want to give up or give up this or give up that. I don't think that's a bad thing, and I, I encourage that. But as long as God is the focus, as long as it's not about pride. It's not like, okay, I'm going to do this, but then I'm going to go back to this, okay? I'm going to be nice to everybody for a couple of weeks, but then I'm going to go back to being a bum after that, okay? Watch out, okay? That's not what God wants us to do. That this should be a period not of just suspending things so we could feel spiritual about ourselves, but I'm surrendering things. And my surrender should never be seasonal. It should become a part of who I am because I'm choosing to trust God's timing. Because we all need help, don't we? Would you agree we all need help, right? I heard about this prayer somebody prayed during Lent one time, and it goes like this. Dear Lord, so far today I'm doing all right. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined, cursed, or even eaten any chocolate yet. However, I'm going to get out of bed in a few minutes, and I will need a lot of help after that. Amen. That about sums it up, right, for you and I. We need his help. We can't do anything apart from him in that regard. We want to trust his provision because he's going to provide for you and I. That's the mindset that we want to have, and I think it's the mindset that we need, we need to have, that God's going to provide for you and I. He's going to protect us in ways that we don't see. He's going to have, as we say, our six, right? He's going to have our back. As we close... There's a story that comes to mind about a young girl who had to pass through what had become a, a really seedy neighborhood um, to get home from work, and she worked late hours. And she had heard that in her neighborhood there was a string of burglaries connected to uh, um, this burglar abducting women. And on one particular night, a store was burglarized right at the time she was coming home but she couldn't believe that the burglar didn't attack her because he had done it so many times before, this pattern of robbery and assault to some degree, maybe robbing a purse or something like that. And so she inquired about it to the police. And she says, listen, my timeline fits it. Did he, did he assault anybody that night? They said, no. Um, the, well, what did he say about it? Because they caught him. And he said, well, he confessed that he robbed the store and he also confessed that he was gonna rob a woman that fits your description. She goes, well, why didn't he do it? She said, well, as he was coming up to approach you down a dark alley, he saw two figures behind you and he left you alone. And later on, he was caught. Let me tell you right now, it's not for us to, you to know how God's gonna protect us. Just know that he goes before you. He's behind you, he's all around. Just know that his presence, it's forevermore. He will never, never leave you nor forsake you. He's got your back. You want to trust him. That's the whole point of fasting is that I'm fasting. You know, maybe today you got to fast because you need an answer for something. Maybe you need guidance. Again, maybe you need discernment. Maybe there's a miracle that you've been waiting on, maybe health-related, financially related. Maybe God's got to open a door, whatever it might be. Fasting helps throw God's power and his timing into perspective because in this world, this technologically savvy, I got to have it yesterday world, we could become, again, so into the now, we're not trusting in the eternal, friends. And even in this self, selfie saturated, even in church life sometimes, this prosperity culture, we could get so caught up in getting and we don't realize God's already given us so much. And if we would just choose to trust his timing and his provision, oh, the great things that we would begin to see that God has already been doing. I mean, thanks be to God that we're here today. And God has a plan for you and I. And he wants us to see as he was illustrating this through his son, as he was, again, they approached him uh, with an agenda. Again, these disciples of John the Baptist, John's no longer there. He's in prison. Again, Matthew's account and Luke's account also give us this. John's in prison by this point. And so they're caught up in their jealousy. The Pharisees in their, their insincerity, together they come with pride. And it tells us again, I got to empty myself of this. I got to get in preparation mode because I got to prepare the fields for blessing. Don't stop believing that God could do the impossible. 
And in this season, as we prepare for the resurrection, as we talk about the enormity of, of that darkness that came over the cross on Good Friday, let us begin to prepare our hearts with fasting. And so I like to recommend to people, you could fast. I, I, again, fasting is good for your health. Uh, spiritually, it's great, as we know. Maybe don't you have dinner, and then the next time you eat is dinner the next day. There's, there's 24 hours right there. And you could, now don't sleep the full 24 hours. I had a friend that did that. That doesn't count. Okay, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. You want to fast. And I would, my encouragement, I could tell you what to do because I want the spirit to tell you, but I'm just trying encouragement and margins. I would say between now and Easter, you definitely want to fast at least once, if not once a week. However, however God's going to lead you to do it. And maybe you can't do food because of medical reasons or you got to talk with your nutritionist or your doctor. That's fine. I'll tell you what we could fast from. We could fast from the phone, okay, the phone, the holy grail of life. The, that's a good thing. Leave that in the drawer somewhere. Um, I want to break it sometimes, okay? Uh, but fa- th- be creative with it. We're not going to be legalistic. I can't just say it has to be ring dings and chocolate or nothing else, or God doesn't hear my prayers. The Bible doesn't say that. Jesus said, basically, the understanding that Jesus tells us, don't, don't be a fake when you do it. Okay, don't look like you know, you're about to collapse, okay? So people go, what's wrong with you, okay? Be genuine about it. It's between you and God. Have the right focus. These are the things he's laid out for us. But you could be creative with it. Lay some things aside. And in that time, with humble, listen, humble expectation, wait on God to reveal things from his word that maybe previously have been under your nose, but you didn't see. God is able, remember that. We just need to be willing. Let us be willing to trust God this way. And let's close with this verse from Psalm 20, verse seven. Let's say this verse together aloud. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Oh, I love that verse. I said that verse verse address is the password for some of my things, so I gotta go change it now so nobody, nobody robs me, okay? Because that's protection right there. That, you know, what they're saying is we're not going to trust in our military resources. Our trust is in God to protect us. Our trust is in Almighty God. And I submit to you today with this message of fasting, let us be a people who are trusting God this way, that God will provide. And if we have any trouble reckoning that in our minds, look no further than the cross and the resurrection, the empty tomb in Jerusalem, that God wants us to know that he will indeed provide for you and I. Let's use this fasting, this practice of fasting, to draw closer to God and leave the results to him. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace how no matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, we're welcome here, oh God. And this is a reminder of that, that you were eating with tax collectors and other sinners, oh God. But your presence trumps all of that. Your presence is greater than all of that. Remind us of that today. Oh God, I pray for anybody today who's waiting uh, for an answer, needs discernment, breakthrough, to overcome an addiction. God, I pray that in these next couple of weeks as we apply these practices, that there would be testimonies, God, of the great work that you want to do. And I pray for God, anybody here today who just, you know, they're just coming, I, I, I was forced to come. Let us remember, God, that what a blessing it is to be able to hear your word and to know that you forgive us, that you've set us free from sin and death. Remind us, oh God, of these things, especially in these next couple of weeks. And thank you for the practice of fasting that we can voluntarily set aside something as needed as food that we can focus on our need for you. And we pray, God, that humbly, genuinely, that there would be renewal and revival out of that. We commit these words now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.